Hi everybody, I hope you guys are all well. It's uh, quite early on Easter Sunday morning. That's I've got the lights on because the sun hasn't quite decided what it's doing, but I've got the window open so you might hear some birds that are chirping outside and making it an absolutely lovely, uh, lovely morning. Um, so what have I been doing this week? Lots of work, of course, as usual. Uh, we hoped that staff levels would be back to normal after the Easter weekend, but it looks like that's not going to be the case. I'm probably going to be even more stressed out in my head for the next couple of weeks, but I'm just going to take each day as it comes. And I'm following my, my top at the minute, it says good vibes only. So good vibes um what good vibes do i want to tell you about well this week is uh, along with reading i've been watching so many theater um productions that have been live streamed through theatre websites, through YouTube. Um, they've been absolutely fantastic and having all of this access to things that you usually wouldn't be able to is wonderful. Like I have absolutely fallen head over heels in love with the production that she's now streaming on the National Theatre um, YouTube page of Jane Eyre from 2015. It never came to the cinema that I was, that, that that's by me. So I never got the opportunity to see it and I adore it. It is wonderful. I'm so upset it's only around for like three more days and then it'll be gone. Um, National Theatre very kind of famously, as it were, don't uh, produce DVDs of their productions. But I really hope after all this is over, they realise from the various comments that because people have been asking and I left a comment on the Jane Eyre one asking if this is going to come out on DVD. There's demand for it. So if there's demand, let it be available. That's what I say, you know, for, it's not fair for people who are not able to go see things. I understand the production is on stage currently, they may want to hold back until after the show is finished. Totally get that. But I'm like, now that it's done, like this Jane Eyre production was 2015, it's absolutely wonderful, but they won't release it. And it's like, but it was 2015 so just do it already so i really hope after all of this stuff is over that it will mean that uh various theater um shows and everything will be more open to do streaming and dvd um sales and such of their productions i really hope so national theater please please make this per version of jane Eyre available because i adore it so much i've only got three more days to watch it um so i'm gonna re-watch it uh, probably either today or tomorrow, I'm not sure. Um, but I've been watching things like Jesus Christ Superstar. Now, Jesus Christ Superstar is a musical that I usually, I'm, I just, it's never caught my attention at all. Never been there, never interested. I've now watched it twice in 24 hours. And I'm like, because the first time I watched it, it was this time yesterday, I was like, yeah, it's all right. Not bad. Good music. Uh, really like the costume design. I'm talking about the, sorry, I should have said the 2012 arena version that's um, streaming through uh, Show Must Go On YouTube page that Andrew Lloyd Webber is, is set up and he's streaming once a week one of his productions. Because last week it was Joseph, that was the first one, and then this week Jesus Christ Superstar. And I was like, yeah, I, I like the set design. Uh, Tim Minchin's good as Judas. I uh, like the costume. Not too bad. A little squeaky at times with the high notes, but you know, not too bad. And now I've watched it again in less than 24 hours. I'm like, oh my god, do I actually like this? Do I deep down like this? And I don't realise. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm going to stop now because I've been talking for like four minutes about all the lovely, you know, very, very stuff going on in my life. Let's. I'm sure you're not interested in that, but it, but. Please, if you're able to watch it, watch the National Theatre's production of Jane Eyre on their YouTube channel. I'll actually, I'll put a link in the description of this video so you can go direct to it. And um, Thursday when it disappears, it'll be replaced with a production of Treasure Island. And I'm thinking, oh, that's, I remember it being advertised, that one, um, for the National Theatre Live. But again, I don't think it actually came to the cinema where I live. So um, I didn't get to see it. So it would be really lovely to see that. And there's something different. So, oh yeah, sorry, just noticed my camera. It, it went really dark and now it's really bright again. Like I said, the sun can't decide what it's doing. So I'm doing the best I can with lights in the room. Um, so yes, yeah, so expect some funny lighting. But anyway, right, it's nearly five minutes in and I haven't even started about what this video is about. So I'm here to talk about Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. Now, this is the 
first book that Gillian wrote, she's written various crime novels, including very famously, she wrote the novel Gone Girl. I've never read that one. This is the first of her books I've ever read. Um, but I have seen the film of Gone Girl and I thought, man, that is messed up. Uh, <laughs> I was like, she's a psycho. Um, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't very fond of her. Let's, let, let's put it that way. I'm not going to say who it is specifically in case for spoiler reasons, obviously, uh, if anybody's reading it wants to read the book but I'm like yeah she's a psycho um so uh, I was like right okay I'm not sure what to expect from this mum and dad uh my mum and dad shall I say uh saw the series the tv series absolutely loved it and then so mum got a copy of the book and she has read it and then she's given it to me to read. So I went into this having absolutely no concept of what it was about, apart from the blurb on the back. Um, I'd seen the trailer for the TV series, but not watched it at all. So I had no clue what I was going into at all. For a start off, for a first book, this is kind of what I was expecting or wanting or craving Black Eyed Susans from last week to be and Black Eyed Susan just completely fell flat so this was a breath of bloody fresh air I have to say um Gillian has is one of these writers where she gives you so much information in a very very short space of time so for example the very very first chapter covers her finding out about the missing girl in town where she lives um, having talking with her boss and because she lives and works in Chicago as a journalist, um, talk to her boss and say, and he agreeing, yep, yeah, you're going to go do that. Her boss is called Curry. They got this really kind of lovely friendship um, together. It's it's really nice. Uh, she then travels there. She quizzes the police, uh, which she doesn't get really anywhere. She finds a search group for the girl uh, and meets her family and then she goes to a hotel so that's seven big events that happen in about 10 pages and you also learn in that chapter stuff that she does for her journalism because she tends to look at um true crime uh really dark kind of domestic related stuff uh you learn about one of her cases as well you learn about her relationships with the people that she works with and stuff and it's like and you're doing that in 10 pages bloody hell girl you know like I was so once I read those I was like this book is like 350 pages long so what kind of roller coaster ride am I going into here because I, I was just thinking that this is gonna like throw so much stuff at you and it does it really does but it does it in such a smart way now I've been told from because obviously as I said I've not read the book of Gone Girl um i've been told that her writing does develop with her way that she constructs uh with, as you go through her books but saying that i was i was actually quite you know raised my eyebrows i was a bit like oh really um with that because i was really surprised at how this is really intricately woven this story um it really does pull the rug out from under you uh it really does um give you lots of information but the f the way that it flows it's it's kind of like a river it's not a a small trickle that leads into a big flowing you know river it is constantly got a flow to it as you're going along 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 sometimes they get the pace gets a bit faster but it's got the same flow throughout it's consistent let's put it that way um so yeah when people said oh her her um structuring improves with her writing over her periods of books i'm like oh okay right <laughs> didn't expect that but okay um because i thought it was pretty it was really well done the actual characterizations are interesting as well I'm not not interested. Not, it's not me going interesting, as in you know, I'm being sarcastic or you know trying to put downer uh, as it were on on this piece of work. Um, but it, it, it's interesting because it's written in first person perspective. So everything that you're seeing is through the eyes of our main character Camille, um, and 
and like like she has major issues with her mum so her every thing when she talks about her mum from the way that she looks to the things that she says there's always like this this feeling of short sharp uh tones and sentences um almost like spitting um to, to in the way that she describes her and then she'll talk about curry her her boss and how warm and inviting uh he is and such and then you've got richard the this kind of mysterious kind of character who changes over time in the way that she talks about him with the various events that go on and how their kind of story leads uh, and then you've got her her half sister Emma uh, who is basically a 13 year old doll um, she very much reminded me or say uh, Emma and her uh, vet and her and Camilla's mother uh, Adora very much reminded me of the Miss Havisham and Estella kind of relationship of great expectations. I really felt that, you know, there was some kind of drawn um, relevance between this relationship in this book and that relationship in the Charles Dickens classic. You know I love Charles Dickens, so whenever I see something that I could link between the two, I'm like, oh yes, there it is. Um <laughs> it's a classic book. How can you not link to it? Um but yeah, I found I'm a very interesting character. Even her name, I was like, wow. Um I loved how dark this story was as well not just dark in the crimes you know the stuff that happened dark is in the tone of the text now last week when i talked about black eyed um susans i was saying how this is dark stuff but you're making all the focus about you the main character and not the situation whereas it's completely flipped in this case it's completely about the case camille doesn't tend to like to talk about herself and such and when she does it tends to be that she's in a hypercritical mood about herself um but also you get this eerie sense in the air all the time as soon as you start the first sentence i mean if i go to this and just say yeah my sweater was new, stinging red and ugly. It was May 12th, but the temperature had dip and dipped to the 40s and four days shivering in my shirt sleeves. I grabbed cover on the tag sale rather than dig through my box of winter clothes. Spring in Chicago. So automatically it feels, you know, that feeling of stickiness and heat and ugh, sweat. And I just love that straight away. I was like, okay, right, we've got a tone, a feeling of texture right there in our first paragraph, which is two sentences long. Like, I was like, okay, let's see how we go. And then she just goes completely dark. Um, so I'll, I'll carry on reading this first chapter, actually, because I, I had originally quoted, I was I bookmarked a couple of pages, um, things here, but just to, get, to talk about the tone. Um, so in my gummy covered cubicle, I sat staring at the computer screen. My story for the day was a limp sh sort of evil. Four kids aged two through to six were found locked in a room on the south side with a couple of tuna sandwiches and a quart of milk. They'd been left three days flurrying like chickens over the food and feces in the carpet. Their mother had wandered off for a suck on pipe and just forgotten. Sorry, there's a plane going overhead. <laughs> really loudly over my house. Okay, there we go. Um, so their mother had wandered off on, for a suck on the pipe and just forgot. Sometimes that's what happens. No cigarette burns, no bone snaps, just an irretrievable slipping. I'd seen the mother after the arrest, 22-year-old Tammy Davies, blonde and fat with pink rouge on her cheeks in two perfect circles the size of shot glasses. I could imagine her sitting on the shambled down sofa, her lips on that metal, a sharp burst of smoke. Then, 
always fast float, floating her kids way behind as she shot back to junior high when the boys still cared and she was the prettiest a glossy lip 13 year old who mouthed cinnamon sticks before she kissed a belly a smell cigarettes and old coffee my editor esteemed weary frank curry rocked back in the in the cracked hush puppies his teeth soaked in brown tobacco saliva see what i mean there's a there's a grit and a texture and a oh i can't even put the words in my mind of what i'm trying to say but you've automatically got this grime that's the word you've got this grime layer already where she's talking about a completely different case she's talking about how uncomfortable her office is how she's all sweaty and it's hot in chicago and then it just slowly gets darker and darker and darker and then you're in real darkness um as she's hunting for the person who has um, taken this little girl, she's missing uh, at the beginning of the book, but later found dead. And also a girl who nine months previously had been murdered in her hometown. So she's investigating both um, both cases. And um, just to get you an idea of a lighter scene, but with dark kind of tone to it, I'm just gonna read quickly this uh, this bit where she uh, meets Amma, uh, basically. Uh, well, no, she, well, this isn't the first time she's meeting Amma, shall I say, just to clarify. This is um, after the missing girl's funeral. So, uh, and Amma was one of her friends. Outside on the porch, I saw a changeling, a little girl with her face aimed intently at, at a huge four foot dollhouse fashioned to look exactly like my mother's house. Long blonde hair drifting in indescribable in rivets down her back, which was to me. As she turned, I realised it was the girl I'd spoken to on the edge of the woods, the girl who had laughed at her friend, with her friends outside Natalie's funeral, the prettiest one. Emma. Naturally, who else would be playing on Adora's front porch but with the little Adora house? The girl was in the childish cheat sundress, matching straw hat by her side. She looked entirely her age, 13, for the first time since I'd seen her. Actually, no, she looked younger now. Those clothes were more appropriate for a 10 year old. She scrolled, scowled when she saw me assessing her. I wear this for Adora when I'm home. I'm her little doll. And when you're not, I'm other things. You're Camille. You're my half sister. Oh, sorry. No, I just realised this is <laughs> this is the first time you met. Sorry, scrap my introduction. This is the first time we've met. You're my half sister, Adora's first daughter before Marion. You're the pre. I'm the post. You didn't recognise me. I've been away too long. And Adora stopped sending out Christmas photos five years ago. Stopped sending them to you. Maybe we still take the damn pictures. Every year, Adora buys me a red and green check dress for the occasion, and as soon as we're done, I throw it on the fire. She plucked a footstool the size of tangerine from the doll's house front door and held it up to me. Needs reupholstering now. Adora changing her colour scheme from peach to yellow. She promised me that she'd take, to the she'd take me to the fabric store so that we can make new coverings to match. This doll house is my fancy. She almost made it sound natural. My fancy. The words floating out of her mouth, sweet and round like butterscotch, murmured with just a tilt of her head, but the phase was definitely my mother's. Her little doll learning to speak just like Adora. Looks like you do, you do a very good job with that, I said, and motioned a weak wave goodbye. Thank you, she said, her eyes focused on the room in the doll's house. A small finger poked the bed. I hope you enjoy your stay here. She muttered into the room as if she was addressing a tiny Camille that nobody could see. You see what I mean? There's an eerie, awkward, uncomfortable grime through all the scenes. And as it goes darker and darker, it's it gets 
worse and harsher and it's it's so interesting so thus this kind of structuring i think really works uh and i was so I, I was rather surprised when people have said to me oh yeah as you read her books her structuring does improve and this for a first book it's bloody great it really is um now when it comes to the tv series as you know, I wanted to watch the TV series after finishing the book and then review them both here. I have Sky. This has been shown on Sky Atlantic. They have been plugging it for ages. That it's available for free on Sky Atlantic. And I just haven't gone there. Now when I have, I find that it's no longer available for free and I have to pay £20 for it on top of my, you know, Sky subscriptions and such. And I'm like, <laughs> no. So I've decided not to watch it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I'm able to watch it on another... Uh, in another way here in the UK if that's possible but yeah I'm not going to pay 20 quid for it if I have absolutely no idea if I'm going to like it but I'll include the link to the trailer uh, in the description below as well so yeah so I would so let's go through my list of questions as I usually do would I read this again yeah I think I would it, it, now that I know the ending and I have to say the final chapter the structuring of the whole book and how she brings that round at the end made for an absolute awesome final chapter so yeah i'd read it again and now that i know what i know i think going back and reading it would be an interesting thing to do uh would i read more of jillian's books yeah i think i would i don't know if i necessarily read gone girl just because um I, I didn't really enjoy the story when i saw the film but maybe it's that thing um the the film version might be quite different from the book i mean even my mum said of sharp objects they changed the ending of the book for the tv series and there's so much stuff in the book um that that really goes in depth that the um tv series doesn't but for both the book and the tv series you have to pay attention that is for this story you really have to pay attention um so yeah so i would i would read more of her her books would i recommend this to someone yeah i really would i i i really enjoyed it it was so much but it, it was like a breath of fresh air after reading black eyed seasons and which i desperately needed um so yeah and if I'm able to watch a TV series rather than having to pay £20, then I will um, watch that as soon as I can. So those are my thoughts on Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. Uh, have you read this book? I'd love to know what you think. If you have a comment in the comments box below, or give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, and tell it to you, let you decide. And I will be back with my thoughts on my next read, which I've already announced, which is Agatha Christie's Witness for the Prosecution. So yeah, we'll see how I go with that one. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys, sorry, the lighting's gone really dark again in here. Uh, I just like that, the lights turn on. <laughs> lights come out um i hope you guys have a great uh, rest of uh, your easter weekend stay at home let's you know work together stay at home and um yeah have a good weekend and if, if you've got nothing to do while you're staying at home this easter weekend watch jane eyre on national theater's youtube page which i will link down below it is absolutely wonderful and if you want to leave your thoughts on that as well please leave them here um all right guys bye